All right, so welcome to lesson 11, passive and active transport. Uh, the key thing here, again, is that we're looking at the ability for cells to move things into and out of the cell. Uh, the ability to obtain that nutrients and eliminate waste. But more importantly, we want to also look at those products that get produced within the cell and how they get into and out of that cell. So when we look at lesson 10, which we did earlier in the morning, which was titled lesson nine, but ended up being less, lesson 10, uh, the key thing here is that cell membranes must be able to retain some of those molecules, those small molecules, but also take in large molecules while ensuring it does not allow in dangerous foreign particles. So it's tricky how that needs to happen because ultimately those cellular membranes are, are what's called semi-permeable. And it's semi-permeable in the sense that it allows things, some things in and or out, but other things it does not allow in or out. Like that question someone asked earlier, uh, do the um, do any of those mitochondria or uh, endoplasmic reticulum, do those leave the cell? Are those going to stay in the cell or will they leave the cell? Well, that semi-permeable membrane is going to make sure that it keeps in everything in the cell that it needs to keep in and keep out everything outside of the cell. So that semi-permeability or selective permeability really helps with that. So our cellular membranes are not the only thing that are membrane bound. Organelles also have those cellular membranes or similar cellular membrane structures inside of the cell. And those organelles within the cell, they allow for transport into and out of that organelle into the specific cellular cytoplasm. So when you look at the Golgi body and endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll cover more in the next lesson, it also needs to be able to keep things in it and transport things out of it. Uh, same thing with the mitochondria, but we'll come to that later on in the lesson. I'll just cover some of this stuff up. So the key thing here with the important terms is that you really have to recognize uh, the difference between some of those terms like solute, solvent, and concentration. Uh, the three definitions that are going to be quite important for this because as we look at concentration gradients and as we look at that passive transport process, you have to really understand that the ability to determine what is dissolved in what and the concentration that it's dissolved at will allow for us to really start to think about it in that term. So solute is the number or the particle that is being dissolved like salt. Uh, solvent is the substance in which it's dissolved into, like water. And the concentration is the number of particles per unit of volume, or parts per million, moles per liter, uh, percentage of volume over volume. Okay, so those are some terms that my hope is that you know from grade 9 and grade 10. And we can move on now. So what is passive transport? Well, passive transport is the act or the movement of particles into and out of the cell without any help. So what will need to happen is that there's gonna have to be what's called a concentration gradient for that to happen. So uh, this does not use any energy, okay? It does not involve any energy. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You will 100% have to answer a question on this in today's quiz, which is, uh, it's a bit longer than yesterday's quiz, uh, similar to the first day's quiz in terms of, of the questions that I asked, because there's a lot for me to ask specifics about each of these lessons. So the lessons may not be as deep as the lessons were yesterday, but it pulls on all of that knowledge from yesterday's content as well. So passive transport does not involve any energy. It doesn't need ATP. It doesn't need to spend that energy. And it's very important that it doesn't need to spend that energy because we will look at different active transports later, but Passive transport, no energy. So there are three types of passive transport that we're going to look at. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Some of those you should have heard before at some point in time, either through last year's science or in grade 10 or even in grade 9. So what is diffusion? Well, diffusion is the driving force behind passive transport. It's the number one thing that happens in the cell, and that is the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That will happen until it is uniformly distributed and equal concentration in both of those places. 
Uh, that concentration gradient is the difference between concentration from the two areas. So if there is a high concentration in that extracellular fluid and a low concentration inside of the cell, it creates what's called a concentration gradient. And over time, that diffusion of particles will result in a state known as dynamic equilibrium. Those of you who have taken chemistry uh, have hopefully looked at this extensively in terms of dynamic equilibrium. Uh, regardless if you haven't taken grade 11 chemistry or not, though, you should have at some point looked at diffusion. So note, even when there is equilibrium established, particles are still moving. And so what I mean by that, let's take a look at some of the diagrams that we've set up here. So what is that concentration gradient, how is diffusion going to work? So in that first diagram, we have that concentration gradient, the difference in concentration between the left side of that cell membrane and the right side of that cell membrane. In step two, it starts to move those uh, solutes what, that are dissolved in that solvent from the area of high concentration to the area of low concentration. And then once we get to step three, we have what's called that dynamic equilibrium. There's equal diffusion in both directions, meaning some molecules will move into the cell, some molecules will move out of the cell, but ultimately it will try its best to reach that dynamic equilibrium where there's an equal concentration of that solute on either side of that membrane. Again, recall that the membrane is selectively permeable and that even though I'm referring to it in terms of a model of a cell membrane, this models that cell membrane perfectly. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one, uh, model of it, but it models it quite nicely. So when we look at simple diffusion, simple diffusion is the ability, oops, simple diffusion is the ability to kind of move particles from a high to a low concentration in the same way um, but it's looking at nonpolar substances instead this time. It's going to move those nonpolar substances across a membrane without assistance or pr without ATP. So again, this is something that we're looking at without the assistance of membrane proteins or ATP, meaning there is not going to be any help from energy. There won't be any help from ATP or any other proteins that are going to facilitate that diffusion. But again, it's the ability of those small, uncharged, nonpolar substances to move across, again, from high concentration to low concentration. So these small nonpolar molecules can actually directly diffuse through that membrane. They're going to be small and uncharged. They can fit through the membrane. So there's no necessary holes that it needs to fit through. It goes directly through that phospholipid bilayer. It's going to go right directly through in between those spaces of that phospholipid bilayer. This is where those small nonpolar molecules will diffuse into. It can get through that membrane with help of from some from proteins, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't need it, right? These bigger ones, though, however, they do desperately need it, okay? So those small uncharged polar molecules, they really, really, really can just right through, no problem, okay? The larger fellas, they definitely need some help. And we'll talk more about that when we look at that uh, active, more active diffusion part, okay? The last one I want to talk about is facilitated diffusion. So what is facilitated diffusion? Well, this is kind of like the first step in the direction that we will look to understand how larger membranes start to move through, or sorry, larger molecules start to move through the cellular membrane. Uh, so what is facilitated diffusion? Well, it's, it's quite frankly, it's important, absolutely important to that membrane proteins assist in transporting these larger and charged particles, okay? So while I talked about those things that diffuse naturally through, like through diffusion, or when I talk about the simple diffusion of those small nonpolar molecules, now we're looking at those larger molecules and how they get moved through, as well as those smaller charged particles, which can't necessarily just uh, pass through that membrane without any help. So these still move through a concentration gradient, again, from high to low. That's the one cool thing about that passive transport is that it's always going to be from high to low concentration. Uh, but when equilibrium is reached, diffusion will stop here. So how does that happen? Well, the transmembrane proteins that I talked about in last lesson will open and close to allow things to pass through. Uh, and it will prevent other things from joining it. So it only has that specific molecule in mind, and it will open and close to allow that, just that specific molecule to pass through, meaning that it is selective, and it will only allow that certain thing in, or in some cases, the certain thing out. So again, I just want to take that time just to really talk about the idea that these are larger 
or charged particles that can't naturally just diffuse or uh, pa passively pass through, there has to be a little help involved. And how that help happens is through things called channel proteins as well as carrier proteins. So let's take a look at those channel proteins first. And when we look at channel proteins, what I mean to say here is those proteins that we talked about in the cell membrane that allow for movement into that cell. So the channel protein is kind of like a tunnel through that membrane. It allows for specific things to pass through and it, it utilizes aspects of osmosis and H2O homeostasis, which I'll talk about more as we move through. So as you see on that diagram to the left, there is water on the top part, ECF, the water of the cytoplasm on the bottom half of that cell membrane, just over here is what I'm referring to. And then we have our phospholipid bilayer. And then we have that tunnel protein, what's called an aquaporin, if you will. And that protein allows hydrophilic amino acids to kind of move through that cell membrane. So it's a hydrophobic protein, okay, a hydrophobic amino acids that anchor into that membrane and they allow for the hydrophilic amino acids to pass through. So it takes advantage of that hydrophilic hydrophobic amino acid reaction and it allows for that water or for any type of specific molecule that is, is going to pass through, it allows for that to happen as a result of that hydrophobic hydrophilic interaction. And I'll talk more about that as we move through this, because it, it's a little bit of a tricky component to, to wrap your head around, but we'll come to it a little bit more later. And then we have carrier proteins that open and close to transport uh, a specific molecule like glucose, and they open and close kind of like an enzyme would uh, as a result of having that allosteric uh, bond or that allosteric spot filled, it will open and close based off of similar messengers just like that. Okay, so let's take a look at how rates of diffusion are going on within the cell uh, because the specific rate of diffusion will kind of help limit, uh, again, when we talked about enzymes in our last lessons uh, yesterday, the rate of diffusion will really have an impact on how much cellular activity can go on. Because if there's a large rate of diffusion into the cell, that means there's a lot of things for those enzymes and proteins to interact with. Meanwhile, if there's a lower rate of diffusion, it's going to have a bit more trouble maintaining those reactions. So the rate of solute movement from one side of the membrane to the other is the rate of diffusion. In simple diffusion, rate is proportionate to the concentration difference across the membrane, right? I talked about in simple diffusion, we're just looking at a movement from high to low until that equilibrium is reached. And the rate is proportionate to the concentration difference. Meaning if there is a huge concentration outside of the cell, and little to nothing inside of the cell, it's gonna be a quick rate of diffusion in. If there is a, you know, a slightly above average amount outside of the cell and a slightly below average amount inside of the cell, the rate of diffusion will be much slower. So it really depends on the concentration difference across that membrane. In facilitated diffusion, however, protein transports or transmembrane proteins become saturated by the solute. The rate will not increase indefinitely. So. What happens here is we have a logarithmic curve that happens and it starts to slow down. Oops, I'll make that highlighting a bit bigger. It starts to slow down once it gets saturated. So once that solute becomes saturated within the cell, it kind of acts as an inhibitor to that protein transport, that facilitated diffusion, and it prevents that reaction rate from increasing indefinitely. So that's one of the big differences with regards to simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion will have that rate that's proportionate to the concentration difference, and it can increase indefinitely if the extracellular fluid is continuously saturated with whatever molecule is moving across that membrane. Meanwhile, in facilitated diffusion, once that cell becomes saturated with that thing that is moving in, those transmembrane proteins, they start to slow down the rate with which they bring stuff in. So osmosis, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, oh boy, whenever we talked about that, grade nine, I want to say. Um, but what is osmosis? Now we're going to look at it in specific details with regards to how it works within the cellular membrane, okay? So you hopefully will have an understanding of how osmosis works as a whole from your previous science classes. Uh, and again, the key thing here to recognize is that passive diffusion. No energy is needed from the cell. 
All right, no energy is needed from the cell. Water will also move based on concentration gradients, uh, it, and it will always move from a high to a low concentration. All right, high to a low concentration. So in the context of water, if there's a high water concentration and a low solute concentration, it will move that water from a low water, high solute concentration. So again, from high concentration, whatever that is, to a low concentration. I sound like a broken record, but it's it's really important that you recognize that with that, that passive transport, high to low concentration. So let's take a look at these three types of solutions. I don't wanna to spend too much time uh, looking at them because it should just be reviewed from grade nine, uh, but hypertonic, hypotonic and isotonic solutions. So hypertonic is a high concentration of solute outside of the cell compared to the cytoplasm. The water movement will be out of the cell, all right? This is the one thing that I want you all to focus, oops, that I want you to focus on in terms of how we're looking at hypertonic and hypotonic. We're looking at the water movement out of the cell. So uh, imagine it is, I, I, this is where I get to talk about food often. Imagine it's a Friday and you're having French fries. And for me, as far as I'm concerned, the only way to have French fries is with excellent, excellent amounts of salt on it. Uh, so I've consumed this entire basket of French fries. And now there's a huge amount of salt in my extracellular fluids around the cells. So lots and lots of salt into my body. And now the ECF is now inundated with high concentration of salt. This is going to cause that water that's inside of my cells to leave the cells. That's where that dehydration parched sensation gets after you eat an absolute metric ton of any salty food like chips, fries, what have you. So the water movement will be out of the cell after you have an entire basket of French fries. Okay, so hypertonic solution, think you've just eaten a ton of French fries, water is leaving the cells. A hypotonic solution, hypotonic solution, is there's gonna be a lower concentration of solute outside of the cell compared to the cytoplasm. The net H2O movement will be into the cell. Okay, it is now Saturday morning. Oh my God, I had way too many French fries. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drink 60 water bottles. Okay, that's too much. I'm gonna drink five water bottles worth of water. I'm chugging this water, chugging this water, chugging this water. Now the concentration of the solute as a result of this huge influx of water the concentration of the solute in the extracellular fluid is now low. There's not as much salt concentration in that ECF. As a result of that, now that hypotonic solution is going to cause the water to rush into the cell, rush into the cell. So hypertonic, I've had too many French fries, water moves out of the cell. Hypotonic, I've drank a lot of water and now water is moving into the cell. Now, as I, every time I always talk about this, I need to have water. So pardon me one second. Excellent. Okay. Isotonic solution is the last one that we're going to look at in a little bit of detail here. Isotonic solution. The solutions have approximately equal concentration. Dynamic equilibrium for water is reached. So isotonic solution, you've had the right amount of French fries and the right amount of water and there's gonna be that dynamic equilibrium for water reached. The diagrams there are just looking at the concentrations. Uh, you can look over those diagrams later if you would like, but I don't wanna spend too much more time on talking about those dynamic, or sorry, those diffusions. So why is this important? Well, the movement of water into or out of our cells helps establish, to establish dynamic equilibrium will cause cells to shrink or swell. If you remember from your grade nine science, when water rushes into a cell, it expands or swells. When water rushes out of a cell, it shrinks. This is gonna be very important as we look at some of the cellular systems moving forward. Okay, active transport active transport, now we're looking at the spend expenditure of energy to move things against, against a concentration gradient. So again, before in that passive transport, we're looking at moving things from a high to a low concentration, whatever that might be, whether it's water, salt, sh uh, sugars, what have you, moving things against a concentration gradient. Now, we're looking, thing, uh, we're looking at things against a concentration gradient. ATP energy needs to be used by the cell, and ATP is what's called the, the cell's energy. We'll talk more about that moving forward. And it's moving things from a low concentration to a high concentration. 
it's going to use what's called primary active transport. And this active transport pumps whatever it is you're trying to get into the cell. Uh, and they're using those pumps to move those positively charged ions from one side of the membrane to another. So there's a couple of things here that are important. It's positively charged ions we're moving. And it's going to move them from one side of the cell to inside of the cell using those transmembrane proteins. Okay, by pumping ions across a voltage is established a difference in electrical potential energy due to ions on either side of that membrane. What it's really saying here is that we are creating a charged system on one side of that cell as a result of moving all the positive or the negative ions out of that fluid. So depending on where it's moving, either into the cell or out of the cell, it really depends on what we're trying to accomplish. As we talk more about neurons and as we talk more about electroconductivity uh, and that electrochemical gradient, this will become quite important. So the important thing with regards to that concentration of gradient ions, uh, this voltage or this change, that difference in electrochemical uh, charge due to those ions is called electrochemical gradient. It's going to be a different charge particle. Concentration is going to be different on one side of that membrane versus the other. Okay, and then we're talking about that concentration of that ion. And I, and I get it. Some of you may not understand quite what I'm talking about yet. Don't worry. As we get into that cellular respiration and neurons firing concepts, hopefully it will be, become a bit more clear. All you really have to know for this lesson is that in, with regards to that active transport, we're pumping ions into or out of the cell to create that trans or uh, to create that electrochemical gradient. Okay. And having more or less positive charged ions on one side of the cell or inside of the cell, that electrochemical gradient can be harnessed for things like cellular respiration within the mitochondria that helps to make that energy. Or it's also useful with regards to, like I alluded to earlier, neurons firing the transmission of nerve impulses. So that's one type of passive or active transport. Another type of active transport is what's called secondary active transport. Secondary active transport really relies on that primary tra active transport to kind of happen first. And it can't happen without that primary active transport that we looked at just above. Uh, it can't happen without it happening. So that secondary active transport, it's going to be happening uh, with regards to that concentration gradient being established first by that primary active transport. And the, the cells are going to use ATP energy to move that solute from low to high concentration. Again, the key thing here is you recognize that active transport is moving things from a low to a high concentration. So in this diagram, I have this in bold here. It's very important to recognize. We're not showing the primary active transport. That diagram from above is the primary active transport. We're not showing it here. We're just showing the secondary active transport. So the, the, the thing here with the symport and antiport, we'll learn a little bit more about what those names are as we move forward. But the driving ion and solute move in at the same time. So what this means is that driving ion as well as the solute, the driving ion powers, if you will, powers that reaction for a secondary active transport. And as that driving ion is, is brought into the cell, the solute is brought in as well. So they move in the same direction for what's called a symport protein. So symport, same direction. An antiport, an antiport will drive an ion in and the, or sorry, the driving ion and the solute will move in opposite directions. So if it brings that driving ion into the cell, the solute will move out and then vice versa. If the driving ion is spat out of the cell, the solute will move in. So that's just a quick little, um, I guess, brief overview of the difference between secondary and active transport. The key thing here with primary tr active transport is that that ATP is used to bring in and create that electrochemical concentration gradient. Secondary active transport uses that primary active transport uh, electrochemical gradient to bring in another solute. So in both types of the active transport, uh, the driving ion concentration has to be established by that primary uh, active transport. So regardless of if it's a sim port or an anti port, that driving ion concentration has to be established first. So as that driving ion moves, it's going to provide the energy required for that second solute to be brought in or to be spat out. 
And the keynote here that I have with regards to secondary active transport, uh, it doesn't use any more ATP. And this is kind of why that secondary active transport uh, system is going to be talked about in uh, quite a bit, is that it doesn't use any more ATP. It uses the energy from primary active transport to kind of power that concentration gradient already. So when we talk about why is it so important to think about sodium, why is it so important to think about sugar, passive, active, what have you, here we have an example of the sodium glucose symport, it's called. So in our first step, sodium is going to move from a low to a high concentration gradient. That ATP energy or that cellular uh, currency, if you will, is going to be created or used to, to bring in that sodium through primary active transport. So once that sodium is brought in, in that primary active transport, it's also going to activate that secondary active transport. So as that sodium moves from a high to a low concentration gradient, that ATP won't be required anymore, right? Because we're looking at that, that symport uh, movement. That glucose is then moved from a low to a high concentration gradient following that sodium movement. So symport, they both move in the same direction. We move that sodium from a low to a high concentration gradient in primary active transport in step one. So this is step one. Step one here. And then in step two, we move that sodium from that high to low concentration with no ATP required, right? Because when anything moves from a high to a low concentration gradient, you don't need to use that active transport. However, that glucose then follows it through that symport transportation protein and allows for glucose to move into the cell without using too much energy. All right, folks, that's it for this lesson. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna have plenty of questions to ask, so I will stop recording here. Uh, I'll give you some time to look through section 2.4 and answer some of those questions. And uh, we can take a bit of a breather.